I have to tell you and admit that I feel very humbled by the words that I'm about to bring you because, of course, first of all, I'm not Australian. Uh, and secondly, of course, I'm always conscious that I never want to be someone who um, gets involved in cultural appropriation or even misappropriation. Um, really to assure you and myself too that this comes to you with deep respect and an, um, and, a, and an understanding for this that is hard to explain really. Um, let me share with you one very quick story. I was in um, uh, a national park in Western Australia. I happened to be with my sister actually, we we're doing a road trip through uh, what they call the outback. And we're in the, literally in the middle of nowhere in this incredibly beautiful, stunning national park. My sister loves hiking and she was like a gazelle jumping up a waterfall and clambering around. And I meanwhile was on a ledge looking up and just marveling at all the different colors. I took a photograph of it actually. I was so um, blown away by the juxtaposition of the deep red brown earth and the white of the gum tree and the blue, 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 blue of the sky and the green of the leaves. And there this gum tree was perched on the edge of this cliff and I was just marveling at it. And perhaps because I was so enwrapped, I hadn't noticed that there was an Aboriginal ranger standing to my left. And uh, he rustled a little bit and I turned around and he smiled sweetly at me and he said to me, you get country, don't you sister? And I didn't know whether what, what what surprised me more, the fact that he'd called me sister or the fact that he could see that I got country. And I said, yes, I do. And I want to thank you for sharing it with me, for allowing me to be here, just to enjoy the land that you and your ancestors have taken such beautiful care of. Thank you, thank you. And he said some pleasantries and said I was welcome and then shortly just disappeared into the bush. But that stayed with me because I felt that even though I am what uh, the Aboriginal people would call white fella, um, they could see, I think, or he could see at least my heart and knew that it was with great respect that I was there and it's with great respect that I share these words. Um, almost exactly 11 years ago, almost to the day actually, um, I flew to Sydney uh, because at that point, my then partner and I were considering moving, leaving New York City and moving to Australia. And because it was my first day there, and because it was my birthday, I decided to uh, make it my business to sit with an Aboriginal elder while I grappled with this decision. And it was on that day that I encountered someone who would become a very profound teacher in my life. I, again, can't use his full name because he, uh, unfortunately, he died uh, in 2017. But let's just call him Uncle Bob. And uh, Uncle Bob was one of the stolen generations. And uh, many of you may know that, um, sadly and tragically, in Australia, it was government, pop, government policy from about the mid 1860s, I believe, all the way through to 1970. That, so that's more than 120 years. Children were forcibly removed from their families and from their communities and taken to a variety of different schools and church organizations. You know the story. And um, were being educated in the ways of culture and um, proper tradition and the the white what they would call the white fellow way. Um, he was one of the stolen generation and he was taken from his family at a very early age. I believe he was eight, and his country was around Uluru, <clears throat> and his mob were the custodians of Uluru, and he'd suffered much. Um, if you and I'm going to post uh, a, a video, a film that he made shortly before he died, 
where he talks about his experiences and he talks about the teaching, some of the teaching that I want to share with you today. But in his journey to healing and forgiveness, he, he taught about four principles. Um, so I'm going to give you, and I, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation. So I, Uncle Bob, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I want to bring it at least um, and share it with you. Uh, so he was passing on this traditional knowledge of the four principles of life. And that is number one, Ngura, which is um, belonging to land wherever you are, belonging to land. The second principle is walicha, which is belonging to family, to your kin, and to your community. And the third principle is kurumpa, which is an understanding of your belonging in terms of the spiritual dimension of who you are as a human, your spirit, soul, your love, your essence. And then the fourth one is Jokopa. Um, I know I've pronounced that right because he taught me Jokopa, <laughs> which is an understanding and appreciation of creation and of universal law uh, what the Aboriginals know of as, of as dreaming or dream time. So under the umbrella, these four principles come under the umbrella of what um, his ancestors called Kanyini. And the name of his documentary, his film, is called Kanyini. And basically, if you think about it, uh, if you were to translate it loosely into English, it would be, as I've said to you earlier, um, connection and belonging and he taught that it's basically in terms of the human experience irrespective of whether you're aboriginal or whatever it's the human experience the four legs of a chair and that if you were to take even just one of those away well what would happen the chair would topple over and Kanyini also translates as an understanding of the deep, what he would call the responsibility, the human life responsibility to be custodians and carers of all four of those principles. The caring of the land, the caring of your family and kin, the caring of your spirit and your soul and your essence and the caring and the respect towards creation, law, uh, spirituality, dream time. And of course, as he had to find out, all four of those legs were taken from him as a stolen child and a stolen generation. And his life purpose after that was about the restoration and the reclamation of those four chair legs and hence his profound teaching came. And the second person I want to share with you is, uh, his name is Tyson Yonkaporta. Now I can say his full name because he's still alive. Um, he is amongst many things, um, a deep thinker and a, a university professor now and a writer. And uh, his book has been um, very, very special to me. It's called Sand Talk. I'll share a little bit of that with you before we sign off today. But um, what caught my imagination in, in the first chapter is that he takes, so in, in uh, many Aboriginal languages, they, they have an extended word for I. Um, for us in the West, of course, I, and I know that uh, you know the whole concept of I has been so influenced by um, a lot of um, you know obviously Greek thinking and Reformation and all of this. But for for um, the Aboriginal traditions, the word I actually extends out like this, and it becomes and he calls it us dash two us two. And for him, one us is 
our cultural and relational being. And the other is the product of the system that inflicts its ideology onto people, whatever that system may be. And so the key thing is that dash in between the us and the two, which he extrapolates throughout the book is basically um, the unexplored space between those two dimensions of the I experience. I was in a planning meeting in Cape Town just two weekends ago. It all seems a little long, far away from me because I'm not there at the moment, but I was in a strategy planning meeting for an organization that I volunteer for, an interfaith organization. And I had the great privilege in my small group, we broke out into small groups, and one of them happens to be a, a also a woman um, who's very um, linked and connected to her African traditional um, understanding and, and ways of being. And she asked us all a question, and I thought, oh, what a tremendous question to ask of myself and also of one another. She said, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? And that has left a profound effect on me. Yes, what kind of ancestor do I want to be? Well, as we've seen both from um, Tyson and also Uncle Bob, we're called to be custodial beings. And to do so, we have to understand the complex patterns of creation. And we know indigenous knowledge systems across the world understand this in a way that um, I, in many respects we've lost or we've ignored or we've stamped out or we've um, dismissed. But the reason that uh, Tyson calls his book Sand Talk is that tr in traditional uh, teaching, as you know, um, certainly Aboriginal um, tradition is an oral one so you're passing down dream time dreaming the custodial laws um, orally and um, very often the elders will just draw symbols in the sand and then unpack those symbols as part of the training and the education and it reminded me actually very much for those of you who are familiar with that lovely account of Jesus um, when um, there's crowds gathering around and he's just quietly drawing in the sand and people don't really understand what it is that he's drawing. I thought to myself, um, perhaps it's a similar concept there. There's so much to unpack around this. But let me share with you three things before I read a little excerpt with you from Tonka's book, uh, Tyson's book, sorry. One of the symbols, it almost looks like um, it's a circle with a, um, um, a lotus leaf type thing where the leaves are going out and the leaves are coming in. And that's that understanding that for, for their tradition, time is not linear. It's three dimensional. Um, and that there's this constant moving in and out, in and out of time, past, present, future. It's all just moving constantly. And interestingly, I found out from his book that uh, every three generations, time is reset. And that he said, you could get off the telephone talking to your great grandmother, realizing that in accordance with this law, she's your niece. Hence, this time moving, it's not linear. And even things like the air that we're breathing, the water that we're drinking, it's all part of the past today and the future to come. He also um, talks about our concept of what we consider animate and inanimate. And I was very challenged by this, of course, because as open as I like to think I am, even things sometimes like rocks, um, even I would be guilty to think of it as quote unquote, just a rock. But as, um, as Tyson pointed out, rock 
um, is it is animate because it's the holder. The, they consider it the knowledge keepers. And very often in the stories, um, you'll hear a story of someone who broke the law and was uh, ch turned into rock. And I love what he said that if one has to remember that inside that rock is knowledge of what is right and wrong and we would do well to respect it and to learn from it and to remember and to ask and to remain curious and to remain um, respectful that not everything is animate and inanimate it's all the same and then one other thing that I must share with you, because I thought, gosh, if we could just grasp this one concept alone, wouldn't it be life changing? If there's a disagreement in a family or clan or between communities and it ends up in a fight, according to Dreamtime, according to law, Aboriginal law, if you inflict a wound upon the person that you are attacking or that person has attacked you, at the end of that fight, you must receive the same wounding that that other person had received from you. And therefore, one has to be mindful <laughs> that whatever is inflicted will be inflicted upon you. And therefore, people tend to be very cautious about how over the top and explosive their disagreements might be, if you think about it in that way. So let me close by sharing with you. He showed the symbol, of course, of the hand. And uh, I know that for many of the rock paintings, you, you see the hand as a multi-dimensional meanings. But he was talking about the presence of these four fingers. And each finger representing a different concept that we would do well to remember and to learn from. He said that we would do well, he said, in working towards sustainable solutions for our lives, our societies, our communities and the world. The first step, so finger number one, is aligned with values and protocols of introduction, the setting of rules and boundaries. This, he said, is the work of our spirit. The second step, so finger number two, is what they would call connect. It's about establishing strong relationships and routines of exchange that are equal for all involved. Your way of being and of relating knowing that all things exist in relationship to all other things. And this, number two, is the work of your heart. The third step, reflect. It's about thinking as a part of a group and a collectively establishing a shared body of knowledge to inform what any of us would do at any given time. This, he said, is the work of the head. And the final step, number four, direct. This is about acting on that shared knowledge in ways that are negotiated by all. This, he said, is the full work of the four fingers of the hands. Respect, connect, reflect, and direct. In that order, he says, everything in creation is sentient and carries knowledge. Therefore, everything is deserving of our respect. So I wanted to finish this idea off with another great teacher 
Um, we'll have to call him Archie because he died in uh, last year, uh, July 2022. He too was part of the stolen generation. He was an activist, very concerned in healing and reconciliation and land, and very famous for a song about being a stolen generation called They Took the Children Away. This is one of his last songs shortly before he passed away. And I thought it was very appropriate because here he is standing in the midst and the bridge between these two knowledge systems, these two lives, these two realities, this incredible journey he's taken towards healing and reconciliation. And his parting song, well, not parting, but at least part of the, the body of his music that was would be uh, some of his last, is called It's Not Too Late. So I thought it would be better that I close this with Archie's words and Archie's spirit and to remind us all that we are in this together and we can all be part of this understanding and that it is not too late. If you like this video, please like us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell to be notified whenever we post a new video. Thank you.